I'm about 10 years old and uh, not the richest kid in class, fortunately not the poorest kid in class either. In walks one of my classmates with a nice fancy box. This is a junior chemistry set. Inside of this box are lotions, potions, powders, solutions. You mix them with each other, colors change, flames, fumes, sparks, strange odors at times, and I'm in love. I'm in love with chemistry. I love this thing, right? Years later, I still do it. I mean, I work with DNA, I work with RNA, I work with proteins, peptides, small molecules, drugs. But the fascination of mixing two things and seeing if something happens is what attracts me the most. And then I go along and I start to run a business. And the business is helping people who study interactions. It's always been about interactions for me. And as I go along, I realize that you know life is not very far away from these interactions either. What we do in real life, our personal interactions with people, business interactions, are pretty much like chemical interactions. In fact, every time I see a human interaction, I can relate it to a chemical interaction in my mind. What do we do when we study an interaction? The simplest interaction for those of you who don't know chemistry, A plus B gives AB. A very simple interaction to understand. So we characterize this interaction. When we study an interaction, we characterize an interaction in the lab. What do we do when we do A plus B gives AB? One of the first things that we do is, does the interaction happen? Does AB indeed form or not? That's the first question we ask. Now, there is a drug discovery lab that's working with a pain receptor. You have a bad ache. That means your pain receptor has gone bad. You need a molecule that needs to react with this pain receptor and inhibit it, bond to it, right? A eureka moment in a drug discovery lab is when you have a pain receptor and you find a molecule that actually binds to it. That's a big eureka moment. We celebrate that, right? In real life, too, sometimes we have these interactions and we need to celebrate those interactions. Does AB form, right, in real life? In personal interactions, does AB form? There's no fumes or strange odors, uh, but you still have those signals coming out that tell you that AB is indeed formed. I was sitting in a training session, a CPR training session a couple of months ago, and a bunch of students sitting across, all of us asking questions, you know, talking to each other, and suddenly one of the participants in the session asked a question. Can you administer CPR to someone who is suffering from epilepsy? There was a spark there, a small spark. I looked at the person who asked this question, and at the end of the session, right, I decided to do something which we all need to do with those small intermittent interactions. You know what? Explore the interaction. Don't let go of that interaction. I decided to explore the interaction. I asked, does anyone in your family suffer from epilepsy? Why did you ask the question? She said, I suffer from epilepsy. AB was formed. So much time has passed, I think I found my best friend because I explored the interaction. So good you explore the interaction, right? Is that all characterization that you do? I don't think so because you need to ask the question, how fast does this interaction happen? How slow is the interaction, right? Let's say you found this molecule that binds to this pain receptor. Did you cure pain forever? Don't jump to the conclusion, right? What if A plus B formed AB, but took eight hours to form AB? You would have a pain relief pill in your, in your hands. You would take this pill, and it would take eight hours for you to get rid of that headache. Not a good idea. What if it came off in 10 minutes? In 10 minutes, your headache would return. Not a good idea either. Let's change the example, right? What if it were a sleeping pill? And you took the pill and fell down right there, sleeping. Instant reaction, right? Great idea. 
But then the problem is, what if the pill never came off? You would be sleeping beauty or Rip Van Winkle. You would never wake up, right? So ask the question, how fast is the interaction? How slow does it happen? Speed is extremely important. Engineer the interaction in such a way that the speed works for you. In business, let us say you're trying to sell an expensive watch. You're standing across the counter and someone walks up to you and you're trying to sell him an expensive watch. You can't take three months trying to impress that customer, can you? It has to be instant. You have to engineer the interaction so that the impression happens fast. What if it was a multi-billion dollar deal that lasted 10 years? Now, the interaction can take time. You can actually take time engineering the interaction so that the kinetics of the interaction is in favor of what result you're expecting, right? So we have kinetics done. How strong is the bond? How strong is the bond between two chemical entities, right? Extremely important to realize because some bonds are very, very strong, but some bonds are weak. A plus B gives AB all as hunky-dory in the chemical world. In walks C. AB interacts with C. AC is formed. B is left all alone, right? This is called a di displacement reaction. Happens in chemistry all the time. A lot of people in relationships can relate to this very well, right? Happens in business too. You have a great relationship with a customer. This customer is your best customer, gives you so much revenue, right? In walks C, your competition, right? Snatches this customer away from you. AC is a much stronger bond than AB. What's happening here? Can AB come back again? In chemistry, we talk about multiple bonds. You know? So if you had two chemical entities that were like this, bonding here, strong bond but still can be broken. What if you made it a multiple bond? Two bonds, stronger than one bond, right? Three bonds, even stronger. Work towards multiple bonds. That's what you need to do in, in business too. Find different themes to bond with people. Find different themes that you can bond with people so that your bonding is not just based on one thing, not based on revenue, not based on how influential the customer is, but multiple things. Make your logistics talk to the logistics of the customer. Make your finance talk to the finance. Make your scientists talk to the scientist. And suddenly you have multiple bonds being formed. Multiple bonds are stronger than single bonds. Chemistry all over again, right? So you have the strength of the bond. Everyone who's been in a relationship has asked this question, right? How much of myself should I give into this? Right? Chemistry too. Quite often in chemistry you ask that question. right? You have examples where a few grams of something reacts with a few tons of something. Take the example of your catalytic converters. You have an 18-wheeler truck. right? 18-wheeler truck over a period of 10 years probably pours out tons and tons of carbon monoxide and NOx gases. right? Yet, about three to five grams of platinum and rhodium in the catalytic converter over a period of 10 years, tons and tons of NOx gases and carbon monoxide coming out that can potentially poison the planet, converted into carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and oxygen. A very little bit of something can sometimes catalyze tons of a reaction, right? The same thing is done in business too. How much effort, how much resources do you put into a certain deal, into a certain customer? What dictates it? Is it the amount of revenue you get from the customer that should dictate it? Is it how important or influential he is? Is it your company policy that should dictate it? Is it your personal ethic that should dictate it? The question needs to be asked. And what you should look at is ROI, except it's a return on the interaction. Start to look at what is the return on this interaction that I'm expecting. And then probably you characterize the interaction a little better, right? Now, one question, right? Fukushima, Bhopal, actually successful chemical reactions, right? Not, not safe reactions. Devastating reactions, but good reactions. As if you wrote the reaction on a piece of paper, it'd be a good reaction. Is it safe? Hundreds and hundreds of people die because of what you call side reactions to drugs. Not safe reactions. 
The question to ask in an interaction is, is, it, is this a safe interaction, right? If you have a customer who bonds with you greatly, right? Good, kinetics is perfect, right? Your strength is strong, but he has a wink and nudge approach to integrity, hmm. right? Do you think that's a safe interaction to have? I don't think you want to have that interaction. So the basic question you need to ask is, do I really want this interaction to happen? A very important question. Some people told me this is the first question you should ask. But as a chemist, I think this should be asked at some stage, right? So do you really want this interaction to happen? Ask the question. You characterize this interaction further, right? Now that you have it all in place, one big philosophical question. Why do interactions happen? Anybody who's been through 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade chemistry knows why chemical interactions happen. Chemical interactions happen. A and B interact to form AB because A and B have higher energy states and AB has a lower energy state. That means to lower the total energy level, AB is formed. To lessen the amount of chaos in the system, AB is formed. AB is formed because elements, substances seek stability. And that is the reason why human interactions happen too. That is the reason why business interactions should happen too. So that there is greater stability. That is it. So once you know that you've characterized this interaction with these five questions, then I think I've answered all the questions. But one important thing stands out is where are the interactions happening? Where are the interactions happening? Today chemical interactions happen not in a test tube, not in a petri dish, they happen on the computer. We have softwares that can simulate a chemical interaction. I can take any fancy chemical, react it with any other fancy chemical, I can look at what the interaction would be on a computer. Human interactions, business interactions are beginning to happen on the computer too. Increasingly, I meet a company on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google, on so many places before I actually see anybody from that company. Right? I meet so many, I know more people online than I know in real life. These are virtual interactions. So while we struggle to characterize interactions the way we know they happen already, interactions themselves are changing to another realm. The human being, it's been postulated, is a molecule. This is a molecule at work. You are a molecule. It's a postulation, but makes sense. If you are indeed a molecule, it's possible that you actually behave like a molecule too, like a chemical entity, right? So when you actually delve into these relationships, I would urge all of you to actually seek what characterization actually yields for you. Seek fulfillment, seek enrichment, convert these interactions into relationships. Convert these interactions into good fruitful, enriching relationship. Go make them happen. Thank you.